Greetings and welcome. My name is Mike Bankhead. I am your host. I am a bass player and songwriter from the Jam City, Dayton, Ohio. And this episode is a long time coming. My guest and I had this conversation way back in April, and it is totally my fault that it took so long to get edited and posted. I am very pleased to introduce you to Alex Winters, a talented songwriter, on this episode of the You Could Be My Aramis podcast. This is episode 115. Happy Wednesday. No, it's Thursday. Happy Thursday, Alex. It is Thursday. Happy Thursday to you, Mike. I would like you to introduce yourself to the listeners, please. I know who you are, and we have met in person, but they might not. So I am a singer-songwriter, and I have been in the Austin area for almost 20 years now. And I just released a record last the end of uh, February. I've been writing and performing for more years than I care to admit. <laughs> and I'm never stopping. Uh, really? At least the writing part. I've actually I'm actually taking a hiatus from a live performance right now because we're moving. It's a slow move because I I built out a studio and I've been doing production work for the last three years since COVID, and. Um, so I'm still working at doing studio work in Georgetown in my studio and then um, and then going back and forth between there and Midland, Texas. You don't sound like a Texan too much. Like, where's the draw? Oh, it happens. Uh, it ha- it comes out. But I wasn't born here. I actually was born in Seattle, Washington. And I was there until I was about 17. And then I moved to eastern Washington and lived there for a number of years. And then um, I came to Austin for training for the job that I was at. And um, I know a lot of people who came to the Austin area from, from elsewhere probably have this similar, similar, they feel the same way. But when I got off the plane, it felt like home. And I had moved a lot as a kid and I had never felt that before. So I knew that I had to move here and it took me six years to, to, for everything to line up. Excuse me. It took six years for everything to line up, um, for me to be able to make the jump. And I did, and I gave myself two years to see if things would work out. And that was 18 years ago now. So, but I, if I'm around people who have accents, it definitely comes out now and I don't have a lot of people who say you're not from here are you anymore so I think I must have enough of an accent or my Washington accent must be gone enough that they don't assume that I'm not from here but yeah if I get around somebody who has an accent I and it, and it lingers for a long time and that's what my partner um Kelly she always knows who I'm hanging out with by how I'm talking how much drawl I have you have assimilated then <laughs> yes well, let's so. talk about the record. February 27th, is that the correct release date? Yeah. And it is called Unexpected Trespasses. Correct. So is that about wandering onto someone's property when you didn't want to? Or is yes. it about people making mistakes or both? All of that. Property being uh, metaphorical, but um, it's about... So I always write um, from... Uh, a perspective of relationships, I guess you would say, um, whether it's a relationship with somebody else or a relationship with myself or my parents or whatever that, whatever that is, that's, that's kind of where my perspective always comes from when I'm writing songs. What, what's my relationship with this topic or, or the person that I'm writing about? And in this case, um, I'm sh- sure that a lot of us can relate to um when we when the pandemic hit and we shut down and um a lot of people were faced with emotions and feelings that maybe they didn't know were there or they didn't want to be there 
Um, but we all kind of had to sit in, had to kind of sit in it, you know, whatever, whatever it was that was stewing. And I know a lot of people went through a lot of, um, unexpected relationship turmoil and kind of had to refine themselves. And that's, that's kind of what this, this album is about. It, it's about the, the emotional, I guess you could say about being emotionally hijacked, like falling in love with somebody that you don't really want to be falling in love with, but you know, feelings happen to us. And, and then we have to decide how we're going to uh, react to them. You know, we have to make choices on what our behavior is going to be or who we want to be in that situation. And, and so that's really the crux of what this album is about is those, is those things that kind of sneak up on you and you're like, Oh, I didn't know that was a thing. Uh, now what? So one thing, dear listener, that you will notice when you listen to this record is it is full rock and roll band arrangements. Alex Winters, you are one person. Uh, I can relate to this because I make full rock and roll band arrangements and I am also one person. And I imagine that your approach might be similar in some ways, like you got to go find a drummer and a bass player or the other. How do you go about bringing the songs that you write as one person and making them into this full sound for the album. What is, how, what is your approach to solving that problem? Well, it depends on the song, but for this record, um, because I was performing regularly with a band, I brought the band, I just brought the band into the studio. So these were the guys who I was playing with for several years. And, um, and we all, we all went into the studio together. We rehearsed, um, we started working on the songs beforehand to work out parts and arrangements and that kind of stuff. I mean, I did a lot of the, I did a lot of the pre-production myself. So I knew, I knew I wanted it to be a, a solid like rock record. Like I wanted it to play, uh, I wanted it to be able to sit in a playlist with Hailstorm, The Pretty Reckless, Dorothy, um, Diamante, if that's, I, I, I never know how to say if that's how you say her name, but I love, but I love her style. So I, so I knew that was the the avenue I wanted to go genre wise, and um, and I had the right players for that. So we we rehearsed the sh out of the songs, and then we booked the studio time and went into um, we recorded at Black Room Studios, which is who produced my uh, Black Roses EP, which I happen to love, by the way. Yeah, are we going to talk about how we how we met in person? Uh, if you want to, but I'm going to talk favorite. about the record first one of my favorite stories but um so so yeah so we uh so then we went into the studio went in the black room and um cut the record and and then uh he sent me back some tracks and I sent him back some feedback and then he sent me um some final mixes uh several months later this was, we we kept going back and forth you know honing it like you know, I, I thought we were going to go and cut the studio in 30 days, cut, cut the album in the studio and 30 days later, we were going to be publishing a record that that, that is not what happened. Um, it actually took us two years from studio to release, um, because he, he had a baby and was out of pocket for a while. And I had a bunch of stuff going on. So I was slow to respond, but he sent me back some mixes and I said, you know, this really needs some synths. A lot of rock records have synths mixed in with the guitars to fill out the EQ spectrum and mm -hmm. then also create some lift. Um, it just makes it sound fuller, even though even if it's not like upfront in the mix, it, you can you if you listen hard, you can usually hear there's some kind of string beds or pads or something in the background. And so I had him add that. And then I went to work um, doing background vocal arranging. We had some that we added in the studio, but when I listened to the songs back, I I really felt like it needed a lot more vocal production, not not main vocal production. He did a fantastic job on, on the lead vocal, but I need, it just needed more movement. And so I recorded all the background vocals um, in my studio and sent them back to him. And then he mixed everything back in. And, and then we and then we had the record. And then it was time to work on promotion and release show and all that stuff. 
And then uh, my partner got a new job and we started moving in the middle of that. And so I'm, I didn't get to push the record up front, like pre-release as much as I wanted to, because we were so busy going back and forth, but, um, but it's out there and I'm really happy with how it came out. I'm glad you're happy with it. It's still new. So don't yeah. stop the promotion. Um, I, I think one of the mistakes I made when I first started taking music seriously was not promoting things long enough. Yeah, you got to promote before and after. And after. But yeah. like, not just a little bit after, but like, honestly, promote it until your next thing is out. Right. Uh, and I know that like music blogs always want whatever is out now. But from a listener standpoint, if I haven't heard it, it's new to me, right? So, For sure. And I don't think this is something that's going to sound dated in a year. Uh, then again, I'm a rock and roll kind of dude that thinks that distorted guitar is always in fashion, even though it's no longer. I mainstream. agree. I, and even I though it's no longer you, pop music. You, yeah, and I think if you like that that kind of music, then then this album is really going to speak to you. Yeah. So let's get the listeners to sample via the magic of my editing process. I'm going to drop in every time we touch now. Yeah. played 
Uh, so, Alex, what's that song about? If so, if you feel like divulging it, yeah, absolutely. The the every time we touch is about the electricity that you feel when you meet somebody new and like like literally you can feel the static between the two of you and and the the sort of the daydream that happens when you when in the beginning of the relationship when you're just starting to get to know each other but like uh like when I met my partner it was like the tension was so thick that we made other people around us uncomfortable like waitresses at restaurants couldn't find their words and they didn't understand why it was just it was that thick um that intense so that's really what that's about I'm pretty sure that almost everyone can relate to that. Right? I hope I hope so. I mean, if you haven't experienced that, I, I wish that for you because it's pretty incredible. Your bio says, see, even though I know you, I, I still do the nerdy thing and like a journalist and, and read your website. Your bio hey. says that you really hate small talk. So we're not going to do any small talk, but you did want to tell the story of how we met. So I will, uh, I'll give you space to do that. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so that, that's really cool. So we were at um, the CD baby conference and probably the last one they did in person, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so I'm standing outside talking to uh, Brandon from who's who was we were just in this networking what was it um balance breakfast networking um uh, meetup and brandon talked about how he was doing uh marketing for musicians and i was like oh i need to talk to that guy and so we were out in the hallway talking and um had my back down down the, down the hall and this guy comes walking up and brandon's like hey you know what's going on, Mike? And and I turn around and I'm like, hey, and and uh, Brandon says, uh, hey, Mike, this is Alex Winters, and 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 Mike, Mike stops, like his face changes, and he's like, wait, Alex Winters, and I'm like, yeah, like nobody knows me, um, and he's like, the Alex Winters, and I'm like, yeah, he's like, wait, 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 let me confirm this. You've got like this moody rock song, like really like Evan, I think you said Evanescence or something. Uh, and I was like, I was like, yeah, that's me. Like, how the hell do you know me from Ohio? And I think, I don't know if we ever, did you ever figure out where you had? No, but I had, I had Black Roses in my listen list and saved. So I don't. I have no idea how, you know, I guess in music, it's a, we're all going to run into all the other musicians somewhere, somehow. It, it is and, a and very both, small world. That's we both sure. play and listen to rock music. So I'm going to assume that somewhere in the stuff I listen to, there was a, you know, you listen to stuff and then the algorithm recommends things. And you look around for a job. I'm going to assume somewhere I found your record. But yeah, it's uh I had uh, Black Roses was already something I like to listen to. You know, the funny thing about Brandon is I didn't meet him until that weekend in Austin, and we grew oh, up really? in the, and we grew up in the same county. Yeah, which is I thought, so. I mean, I thought weird. by the way you guys were talking, I thought you guys that were like had been friends for a long time. We had been friends for like twenty four hours, maybe, maybe not even <laughs> that long. Um, but like we grew up in the same place, and we knew we know a bunch of the same people. And since then, he and his wife have come back to Ohio. They don't yeah. live. Uh, they don't live quite so close to me. But they live close enough that we uh, we do things every now and then. He's actually that's played, awesome. Yeah, he's played a couple of shows with me, uh, singing, uh, playing guitar, singing harmonies. He is a good dude. He's gonna get a chuckle out of this when he listens to it. I'll make sure. Yeah, he that to it. that was amazing. I I rarely get recognized or uh, like, but you totally like fanboyed out for a minute, and that yeah. just that made my whole I don't know made my whole life. <laughs> Well, at cool. least my whole weekend but um it's nice to feel useful sometimes was, i like i like when i can cool. feel useful so now i'm going to ruin that vibe by asking you the question that you don't like you we well, you already discussed it before i hit record dear listener 
And Alex does not like this question. And I always ask songwriters because we always ask differently. So for you, when you write, is it lyrics first or music? And I already know the answer, but I want you to tell the listeners the answer. The, the answer is it depends. See, that's my answer too. Why does it <laughs> depend, Alex? I, well, it. I guess it depends on your approach, on how you approach songwriting or what you're what your mission is like a lot of times I'm writing I so I I guess I have two two ways that bring me or two paths that bring me to the I'm going to call it the desk the writing desk um one way is that I'm feeling something really strong and I need and I need to get it out um and in that case it's typically a words first Cause I got, I got some, I think you said this when we were talking about this report, you got, you got something to say. Yep. I got something I got to get out. It's festering inside me. I can't, I can't, it can't stay inside anymore. got to get it out. Um, but then there's also, because I'm a professional songwriter, I have to keep my chops up and I, you have to, I saw uh, Alan Shamblin did a presentation years and years and years ago at the Austin songwriters group. And he said, you have to show up to win. Like you, like you have to show up in order for your creativity to, to present itself on a regular basis. And so one of the ways that I try to show up is by, uh, well, I ran a songwriter group for a decade. Um, so I had uh, every month we had, we met up, but we gave ourselves an assignment and then we had an assignment and a deadline. And so it really, it's just how do you get into that, whatever the assignment is. And sometimes it was a a, a prompt, like a, a phrase, like, well, Black Roses actually, for example, was a, the prompt for the month, that month was panic room. And I was like, how the hell am I going to write a song about a panic room? And I was going through, um, I, I started writing poetry was how I started uh, right, getting into writing. And so I, I have this backlog of like, you know, however many, again, I don't like to do that math, but um, <laughs> I started writing poetry when I was like 12. And so I have this huge backlog of poems. And so I was just going through uh, old ideas and stuff, seeing if anything might fit that theme that I could, you know, use for a seed. And I found this poem, um, which was the verse and the chorus of Black Roses. And I, and then I, so then I used that as the starting point for that song. And then I, um, I don't know if I intentionally did this, but the inspiration, the music is definitely um, Metallica, Nothing Else Matters. It's, you know, it, it's not exactly the same, but, um, but it worked, but they, but they have very similar structures um, and feels. And so I kind of just started there with, with those words and then, and then writing panic room, the phrase panic room into the song and then trying to write music that fits that vibe, you know, minor keys and, um, and then I brought it to group and everybody was like, oh, my God, this is a great song. And I was like, cool. And then I moved on and then came time to like put out some music. And I was I was like, well, what are what are my best, you know, my best songs? And that and that that has been the most requested, most played song of all the songs that I've released. Um, so, yeah, so it really whole circle it just it depends it depends but a lot of times it comes with it starts from some kind of a seed um an idea and then um is if the words aren't coming then i'll then i'll switch to music and see if i can come up with a cool riff or a cool chord progression that makes me feel something and then i will um use the mumble method which i love a lot of pro songwriters do this charlie puth and um Who's the other guy? Um, Ryan Tedder. You just like mumble stuff to the music and then see what words come out. And then you and then you kind of write to that. Um, but a lot. But the songwriter group gives me a lot of prompts. We come up with two prompts every month. Um, and sometimes there's like a, a feel like right in a minor key or one time we wrote a we had a write a happy song that sounds sad or a sad 
song that sounds happy. And I got a great song out of that. Um, so it just, it kind of, it kind of just depends on where you're going with it. I'm going to bet that the answer is similar to this next question, but all right. So Alex has arrived at the writing desk. What's the first tool that you reach for when there's writing time? Pen and paper. Old school. Sometimes it's logic. I, I, now, since I've been doing production work, I will, I will also often compose in logic, but, but old school. Yeah, very much. I'm very much acoustic guitar, pen and paper sitting in, you know, on the couch, seeing what happens. How do you know when the song's done? When it's published. <laughs> that sounds like you tweak it all the way up until the time it it gets mastered. That's what it sounds like. I'm not that much of a tweaker. I kind of, um, <laughs> I, I don't do math either, but uh, <laughs> good. Like, big tweaker now um i i like to make decisions and then when i find something that i like it tends to stick um and i don't i try not to revisit unless something's really bothering me or really like distracting then i'll go back and, and revisit that but um yeah I, i'm not like an endless I'm not one of those people who is just endlessly making changes because you can, I, I would much, my joy is in the songwriting process. I love producing as well, but, um, but my true joy is in the actual like composition process. So everything that I do is like, I just want to get back to writing the next song. I don't, I don't want to spend, I was just talking about this earlier with somebody about, I don't want to spend thousands of hours digging through plugins and finding the right instrument and playing with compressors and that kind of stuff. I just, I want the, the tools that work for me that, that help me get the next song out. That's, that's my focus. I, guess. I like it. So now I'm going to ask you the two questions I ask every guest. Uh, even the ones that are not musicians. Uh, think back as far as you can to when you were a tiny person, a tiny er person. Because standing next to me, you're you're pretty short. But uh, think back to your youth. I'm I'm average, sir. Yeah, I'm I'm large. <laughs> I'm very uh, average height and weight. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm large. I'm large height and weight. Uh, when you were a kid, what's the first song that you can remember hearing in your life? Hearing. Yeah, like the first song. That you can remember that you know the name of. Well, I don't I, I don't know that I could tell you that. I I know I had a little one of those little plastic um record players when I was a kid and I had stuff like uh all I want for Christmas is my two front teeth. You know, like kids kids stuff, but the first like the first song I heard on the radio that I really identified with was Broken Wings by Mr. Mister. I don't think I know that one. That's 19, very 80s. 1983, I believe. Um, and that that song became my anthem in that moment. And if you haven't heard it, please go listen. Yeah, it. I'm going to have, as soon as we're done, I'm going to go song. look it You up. probably have, you probably just don't. Don't know what it's called, yeah. Yeah. That could, that could be. 80, I mean, if it was on the radio, my, my parents had the radio on, of course, in the 80s, like, you know, um, we're about the same age, so we probably grew up hearing a lot of the same stuff on the radio. Yeah. I'll bet when I go find it, I'll be like, "Oh yeah, that song." Yeah, probably. Yeah, and they they only they had two they had two hits. Mister Mister had uh, Kiri and uh, and Broken Wings, and I had a weird relationship with that song for years. If I heard the song, so I never bought the song, I never bought the record because it was a warning. For me, if I would hear the song like in the supermarket or come on the radio, that was a trigger that some big change was coming in my life. And I and I needed to prepare for whatever that was. And it usually it would happen within three months. Um something huge was coming. And so I never 
I never bought the song because I never wanted to break that spell. Like how many of us get a warning like that? I thought I was pretty lucky to, to have a relationship with a song like that. So I, I didn't want to break, I didn't want to break the spell, but um, you know, the internet kind of changed all that because <laughs> now we own all music at all times. Which is a cry and shame because it's hard to get someone to pay us for making music. Um, as you know. I like asking that question because it leads to stories and I like listening to people tell me stories. It's a, it's a great question. I, I don't I don't think I've ever been asked that question in an interview before either. So I, I love yeah. it. This next one I stole, and you've probably never been asked this one either. I stole it uh, from the podcast here in Dayton that is no longer with us, but I think the gentleman that used to ask this stole it from somewhere else, so it's okay. That one is, uh, what did your childhood smell like? Oh, I have heard this question before. Uh, I'm going to say camel cigarettes. That sounds cancerous, potentially. Potentially, yes. Um, yeah, my dad, my dad, my dad smoked camel cigarettes, camel, not, not camel, just camel filters, you know, regular, nothing, you know, not camel straights. I almost said that, but, um, and probably must like we've grew up in, I, I grew up when I was little, little, we lived in trailer. We lived in a travel trailer for a while, like a 15 foot travel trailer and then we moved. We uh, moved up to a, a mobile home. Actually, we moved. Actually, we moved from the mobile home to the travel trailer, and then uh, and then back to a mobile home. Uh, and then sometime in my teens, I think my dad started quitting smoking. So the or the stepmother made him smoke outside. So then it smelled like bleach and sadness. That sounds like and a song rage. Lyric. That sounds very much like a song lyric. <laughs> well, maybe I'll submit that for the next songwriting prompt. <laughs> um, how can the listeners find you on the internet and listen to the new record if they want to? So the record is they out do want on... listeners, you do want to. I'm sorry, I'm telling them listen to the new record. But Thank yeah, you. sorry. Yeah, how do they it's... find you and listen to your stuff? They can find me on any um, digital streaming platform. Um, also, the record is available. I did a short run of CDs. So if you're an old school, like hard copy kind of person, I've got CDs in stock that can be shipped from my website, which is alexwintersmusic.com. That's also where you can sign up for my newsletter and find out about any upcoming, you know, releases or shows that I might have, although I'm not doing shows right now, but, um, but I am working on new music already. So nice. Have some, excuse me. I'm hoping to have some more stuff to release later on this year. Well, you did say that the writing never stops. So on, it does, on I've already thing. got, I think I already have a, the next record, like pretty much written. I just need to I just need to hunker down and, and figure out who I want to produce it with me and push it out, push that baby out. You know what? I wasn't going to ask this one, but uh, now I'm curious. I know you were happy with the way Unexpected Trespasses came out. You spent a long time working on that and you've listened to those songs an awful lot. Mm -hmm. You're not tired of them yet though, right? You, no, you I actually... <laughs> This is probably the the first record where I it, a song comes on and I'm like yes, so yeah. So when the song when this the, a song comes on from it, I'm like oh yes, this is what this is what I meant. Does that make sense? It makes perfect. How sense. How many times as an artist? How many times have you published a song that was exactly what you meant? So. We discussed this when the recording was off, but yeah, I'm on the free Zoom and it it uh, stopped us. It wasn't actually in mid-sentence though, so it wasn't as bad as it could have been. But uh, Alex wanted to do like a professional wrap-up, so like we that. should do that. Or like, like if you that. have anything else you wanted to say, this would now we're 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 rolling again. We could we could just jump back into the conversation. All right, so let's go more about Alex. Your first uh, your first instrument was guitar, yes. Oh, uh, no. yes, my, well, my first instrument, I think, was flute, actually. 
High school or elementary school band? Uh, elementary school band up through uh, up through high school until uh, until I left home at fifteen. So I guess that was junior high. Can you still sight read? Uh, no, I mean, I can make it happen if I need to, but it's pretty painful. So you have, have you thought <laughs> Once about I putting picked, food you know, on a record? I, be, be, what's that? Have you thought about putting food on one of your records? Putting flute? No, no. I don't even, I haven't played. My embouchure is all, it, I'm sure I can whistle again. So I'm sure I couldn't make a note on the flute. Although it might, it might come back to me, but no, I'm not. I don't want to Jethro Tull that. <laughs> he's, he's got the market on the rock flute. I'm I'm good with leaving it there. Maybe maybe Lizzo should put out a rock flute record. Yeah, I actually did a jam though. I did a show with a with a gal uh, several years ago where she uh, played flute and she we did a like a songwriter showcase at a at a brewery and she jammed she jammed all over my my singer songwriter vibe it was great i loved it was this a touring musician or a local texas musician um she's uh i think i think the answer to that is yes okay uh, i i i've not toured but very little um but i think she actually goes out and and does some touring i ask because there's a singer songwriter up here in the midwest that plays flute and incorporates it into her shows, like has oh, it on nice. stage. And when she's not playing guitar, right, she does. Yeah. she does stuff on flute. I think that I think that's super cool. Uh, Me too. I don't know what I would do with the flute, but no, no, I think I, it would I, be I, interesting to put it in a song. Every once in a while, I'm like in a pawn shop, and I'm like, I see a you know a hawked flute, and I'm like. Mm me <laughs> but I'm not I'm I'm kind of working on my guitar skills and my bass skills right now and then the, my next uh the next instrument I want to pick up is is drum acoustic drums um I can program drums pretty well but I want to actually be able to sit behind a kit and keep a beat I would be think awesome. nothing replaces the sound of an actual live kit and a, and yeah. a drummer with feel uh, with, how, feel. with feel <laughs> How long have you been you. playing guitar? Uh, since I was about twelve. All right, so yeah, that that explains why you're so good at it by now. But it was um, it was off and on, like because I I didn't know this. I just I got a late in life ADHD diagnosis. So like everything that I did as a kid, I did for about two weeks. Um, and then like it drove my dad nuts. Like I did ballet for two weeks. I took piano lessons for two weeks. I. You know, it's like up until it becomes work, I'm good. And then once it becomes work, I'm like, I'm moving on to something else. Like, okay, I understand how this works. Now I, now I can go try something else. Um, and, you know, had we known that when I was a kid and my childhood might've been very different, but, um, but yeah. So, but flute uh, music, I mean, writing always stuck with me because it's how I process the world around me. Um, and uh, I would pick up guitar and I would, I would put my poems to music and then I would put the guitar down and I would, you know, do something else for a while. But I was always like listening to records and, um, ca you know, cassettes. And I had a Columbia, you know, I did the whole yeah. PMI Columbia Me CD too. for a penny thing many times. And so I, I started my music collection early and I, I devoured, um, you know, like I think a lot of people our age, like I had a record player in my room with a bookshelf, you know, bookshelf speakers. And I would sit on the floor and look at the album art and read all the lyrics and the and the album jackets. And, and while I was listening to the to the albums and sometimes on headphones, but um, then I had my Walkman that I, you know, I always had music. I was always absorbing lyrics and um, arrangements and background vocals. I used to love to try to sing harmonies through all the way through different songs and um, and then flute. I was I played flute for like five years, so the oh, music was always it was always there. Um, but guitar was kind of in and out until I started really until I really started to try to write songs instead of just kind of you know seeing what happens. 
So yeah, and then when I got in my first band, I kind of had to get better at guitar. I was rhythm guitar and background vocals um, slash stage candy. I was like this goth girl in this 90s rock group. I thought I was Amy Lee from e Evanescence before Evanescence, actually before Evanescence came out or maybe right, right before that. I, I remember listening to bands like Tesla, not Tesla, um, like metal bands. Um, yeah, I wouldn't put Tesla in metal. I'd no, put in I, that was not, I was trying to think. old of, hard rock, right? I was trying to think of the Testament. That was who it was. Okay. Testament. And I, I remember listening to Testament and I was thinking, how cool would it be if this had a female vocal on it? Just like singing like, these beautiful like operatic style melodies and then like Amy Lee hit with with Evanescence and bring me to life and I was like this this is my vision like how did they know that this is what I was craving did you ever listen to Lacuna Coil oh yeah yeah that's the that kind of sound that's yeah, what that the, would remind me of the symphonic uh, symphonic metal is amazing. But with um, the there's lady tons vocalist. of ladies out there making uh, death metal and hard rock and um, and doing it all, and I I love that so much. And yet, you've chosen not to go quite that heavy with your newest record. Yeah, my voice doesn't. My voice doesn't. I mean, I could maybe do some evanescency kind of stuff. I mean, Black Roses was kind was kind of ish, but um, I have such a clean voice that it doesn't. It, my growl and my and my grit doesn't sound very good sonically. So um, I have actually thought about experimenting with some uh, what I call Cookie Monster vocals on some <laughs> songs. Um, so oh, you might you might hear something come out like I really dig um who am I I am really digging on um I have to look it up because I always say her name backwards um Rain Paris um she has a kind of a clean voice kind of like mine but she also kills it with the vocal fry and the like she can do the all the rock voices she's an incredible singer um and her music is heavy and so that that gives me hope that maybe I could make that make that leap vocally. It, it's it's a lot of work to sing like that. It's it's really uh, the body coordination to do it well is. I'm googling her because I didn't know who you this should. person is. Rain Paris. Um, she does a, some great um, covers. Her original songs are awesome as well. But like, um, therefore I am. And um, she does a couple of uh, Billie Eilish covers, which I love. She did the um, the the bar the one from the Barbie movie. She did a great rock version of that. Um, Toxic, Britney Spears. She covered that. I love that version too. There's um, a lot of interesting rock covers of uh, of that particular song. I'm sure. I, I did like a, like Swedish, a singer songwriter Swedish version. Songwriting factory song. Some of those really lend themselves to just cranking up the guitars. You um you wouldn't use your normal clean voice over something heavier? Yeah. Because you know, with the you know, if you're doing it in the studio, you don't have to worry about fighting with the guitars because they can just turn you up in the mix, right? So <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> True story. Um, but I guess. I guess I think I also need the the right guitarist because I'm not a metal guitar player. And so I would I would need to find the right guitarist for that, um, for that job. I know I know the drummer I would call. I, I don't have a problem with that, but uh finding the right guitarist, like that Ben Moody style. You know, if anybody out there knows Ben Moody personally and wants to make an introduction, I would, I would happily take you up on that, because um, I would love to do a song uh, with him. He was Evanescence's original guitar player. If you didn't know that, I did not. Uh, but then sometimes you're just out there with you in an acoustic, so you're versatile. Yes. Well, a good song is a good song. I don't think it matters, right? That is really, truly the test. 
is uh, I, I usually compose on piano, even though I write for full band, but I compose on piano because as a bass player, guitarists usually don't understand what I'm coming from because oh. I don't think like them, right? Um, I don't, yeah. I just don't, I don't think like a guitarist. So when I'm writing a bass line, what I want the guitar to do is usually not so intuitive for guitarists. So I compose on piano so I can give them the whole chord flavors. That's interesting. Um, I was I have a friend who who's a producer and he's a his main instrument is bass and he he's a very he was telling me that too like he's a bass forward songwriter. And so a lot of times when he's writing he's like he comes up with bass like bass and drums first and then he fills everything in fills everything else in later and I thought that was really interesting like I've never tried to write a song starting with bass but i think oh now I, you have to do it that'll be a good i know exercise. that'd be a really fun exercise right um here's even though most of the time i start on piano these days the bass line is one of the first things i do but one of the when i do write on bass one of the fun things is keeping your your major or minor declaration you can keep it pretty ambiguous yeah if you are careful about what note to use in your melody and stuff Right, because mm -hmm. even without the other instruments, if you're singing um, major thirds and major sixths, it'll feel major, right? And if you sing a minor thirds, minor sixths, it'll feel minor. But right. one of the things I like to do as an experiment is see how long in the song I can go before I commit to whether it's major or minor. Um, That's amazing. I, yeah, I had a guitar. I had a guitarist ask me uh why i never played full chords and i'm like well first of all it's rock music so it's like yeah. it's like the one three five man even in like if you're playing in drop d or or bar chords or whatever like a lot of like heavier music is less it's less notes power chords yeah because because if you start playing complicated chords it, you lose you lose it in distortion and layers and um that's not to say that there isn't a place for that but um but also, mainly, I do it because when I'm writing, it gives me the freedom to, it gives me more freedom vocally to come up with a stronger melody as opposed to being locked into the notes that I'm hearing. In yes. The, right? So that also probably lets you leave. I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, so I typically, I tip, I mean, sometimes I do the whole GCD thing, you know, just strummy, strummy. But um, when I'm really trying to write a rock song, I typically play just five chords or bar chords. And and then later on, they're like, is this, I'm, you know, trying to teach the song to somebody else. And they're like, well, is that a F major or minor? I'm like, uh, if, I was in your band, if I was in your band, that would be me, me making that decision because the bass <laughs> actually makes that call if it's ambiguous. Um I mean, with the writer's permission, if I didn't. Write I mean, it. you would have to, you would, it would have to fit within the vocal melody because right. I do, I, because I play so much by ear, um, you know, my, my voice, my, my melodic structure will tell you, but I, but I don't always know that going in, right? And that, that comes out later, like, oh, it's, and I'll have to sit down, sometimes I'll have to sit down with it, be like, oh, is this major or minor? And I have to play the chord and sing over it and see which one sounds right and check check myself before I wreck myself. But if you're writing power chords, you have the ability and melody to go both if you wanted to. Sure. Absolutely. Um, so this is one of the things that I'm jealous about musicians like you who can figure that stuff out by ear, because I cannot. When, when I write a melody, really? I literally sit down with the piano and I find every note <laughs> because I don't trust, I don't trust myself enough to make sound choices on my melodies without guidance and when i'm teaching myself a new song that i've written i literally write out each note in the melody and then write the words under it. and then once i've internalized it then i usually get rid of those notes right but um so as you might imagine uh writing melodies is the hardest part for me when it comes to songwriting and also it takes me forever sure Chord progression no problem See, baseline See, no and problem. i back i back in i back into that i write the song first uh, using my gut and then and then I have to go figure out the the key and the and the uh, you know what notes are in that key and what chords belong and that kind of stuff. And also I'll, I'll suss that out after the song is written. Yeah, I'm totally the opposite. Like I know <laughs> at the beginning, you know what? I'm gonna this is gonna be a minor. 
I mean, you can pretty much guarantee that my song is going to be in a minor key. Me too. Just, uh, I'm just, I'm one of those songwriters. I love writing sad songs. It, it feels good to me. Me too. I have, I have tried to make a conscious effort to write more major key songs in the last year. Um, sometimes they just sound a little too bright. <laughs> yep. Right? It's like... You're like, mm, that doesn't feel like me at all. It's, uh... We're not, I'm not going to put this in the recording. Um, I mean, this part of the conversation is staying, but I'm not going to put the song on the recording because it's not mm -hmm. released. But I'm going to send you something I wrote in a major key as cool. kind of uh, as kind of an experiment. And I'm actually super proud of it. But nice. it does not sound like me. <laughs> like, I wrote it and I think it's good, but it does not sound like me. But sometimes that happens, right? Well, and then, you know, that's something that maybe you can push to another artist. That is something I've actually thought about a little bit. So let's do the official wrap up. I'm going to recap for people that were listening 30 minutes ago when we said this, but we can find you at alexwintersmusic.com. Yes. Yep. Correct. We're also on the Instagram and the Facebook. I see I'm looking at your website and seeing the links there. Yeah, you, you can get all the links use your Twitter there. page. I occasionally tweet. All right. Um, but I'm not super active there, but you but you can find information there if you're on if you're on X, I guess. I refuse it, to call it that. The kids call it. It, it is X, but I refuse to call it that. Yeah, so I, I will link to all these places in the show notes, dear listeners, so that oh. if you don't want to actually type, you can go to the show notes and click and, and go find Alex. And yeah, hopefully... you can find everything on my website. That's kind of the hub of everything, social media, uh, music. Um, I also make and and sell merch um, directly on my website. I make, I make, I love to make stuff. So a lot of the earrings and um, I don't know. I don't even know what all is on my website right now. I haven't done the inventory in a while, but. Um, oh, I will tell you: uh, shirts, hats, oh, yeah. okay. CDs, Good. earrings, necklaces, earrings, necklaces. I make cuticle cream. Make I that. don't even know what that is. It's just, it goes on your fingernails. Tools, I would guess. Uh, yeah. Vanilla extract, which is delicious. It's amazing. Um, yeah. Buy Alex's merch. Independent musicians need need support. Yeah. I love sending out care packages. So. Thanks. We should do this again the next time we put out a record. Yeah, Mike, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. It was, uh, it's really nice to talk with you again. And um, I love that. I love the story of how we met and that we've stayed in touch since then. And um, thanks for bringing me into your world. It is my pleasure. You are awesome. We share a lot of the same experiences as far as how we react to music and why we use it so i think that might be why we get along so well yeah we, sure. we both use it to deal with our trauma and such so yeah and i'm sure we're not i'm sure we're not alone in that i, I think i think without music m most of us would not know how to process anything <laughs> i feel that way and uh, so dear listener if you relate go listen to alex's new record Thank you very much to Alex Winters for having this conversation with me. And Alex, I am so sorry it took me forever to get this episode edited and posted. Today is Friday, October 4th. Dear listener, it is Bandcamp Friday, the day on which Bandcamp waives their customary fees and artists get all of the money when you buy our things. Please buy Alex Winters' record, Unexpected Trespasses. Really, though, I bought this on CD. I enjoy it. If you like Bandcamp, if you like supporting independent artists, you should probably pick up Alex's record. Thank you, dear listeners, for listening, and I'll be back sooner than I was this time with a new episode.